My name is Marshall Wyatt. I am a Raleigh native. I'm a music historian and a record producer. I have a small label uh, called Old Hat Records here in Raleigh. Uh, we uh, produce and reissue old music, uh, traditional American music that was first recorded back in the 1920s and 30s. Bill Monroe moved to Raleigh in February of 1937. He was 25 years old. He was recently married to Carolyn Brown, a woman he had met in the Midwest in Iowa a couple of years earlier. They had an infant daughter, Melissa Kathleen, and Bill rented this house at 1208 Fillmore Street, and he and his family lived here for about 16 months. Bill had come to Raleigh with his older brother, Charlie. Charlie and Bill were professional musicians, and the type of music they played um, in today's terminology would just be called country music. In those days, it was often referred to as hillbilly music, although Bill Monroe never liked that uh, term. Charlie and Bill um, were part of a, an offshoot of hillbilly music that was known simply as the brother duets. There were so many talented professional musical brother duets performing in the mid to late 30s that it became sort of a, a subgenre of music unto itself. And most of those brother duets were either from North Carolina or they were here in North Carolina performing. So you had the Dixon brothers, the Morris brothers, the Bolick brothers, the Delmore brothers. You had all of these different brother acts and uh, Charlie and Bill, uh, the Monroe brothers, were part of that whole movement. Um, but even within the brother duets, the Monroes stood out as being different. Um, Charlie, the older brother, played guitar and was the lead singer. Bill, the younger brother, sung the tenor harmony part and played the mandolin. But Bill would sing higher than any other singer, and he would play his mandolin faster than any other singer. And the brothers, the Monroe brothers, would just perform with um, greater urgency than any of the other brother duets. So they really stood out um, as being different. And they had come here to Raleigh um, because they had a contract to perform on WPTF radio. And they started out with a 15 minute program at 1030 in the morning, three days a week. But within a couple of months, the Monroe brothers were performing on WPTF six days a week. And so Bill would get up early every morning, go from here downtown to the WPTF studios, which were on Fayetteville Street right next door to the courthouse. On the street level was a restaurant and a couple of retail businesses. Down in the basement, they renovated the entire basement and that's where WPTF was located. Charlie Monroe was living downtown on Salisbury Street about two blocks from the station, so he probably just walked to work every morning, met Bill. They would walk down an alleyway between the Pullen building and the courthouse. About halfway down the alleyway was a, was a door. They would go in there and descend one flight of stairs and then they would be in WPTF. Um, there was like sort of a big foyer area and then there were three studio rooms of different sizes. Each of the studios had a big uh, glass window and anybody in the general public who wanted to go down to WPTF and visit could stand out in the foyer public area and look through these big windows and just observe whatever broadcasting was going on at the time. And it actually became sort of a, a fashionable thing to do in Raleigh in those days to um, go eat a nice dinner at the S&W Cafeteria, which was the restaurant there in the Pullen Building. Then after dinner, you'd walk down the alleyway and go down to WPTF and just hang out and see what kind of uh, broadcasting activity was going on. So the broadcasting was an important part of their career at this time, but it wasn't the way they made most of their money. Uh, the radio station paid them almost nothing. Their sponsor, Blackwood Auto, probably paid them a very uh, modest weekly stipend 
but most of the money they made was on uh, personal performances, personal appearances in the area. They would put a lot of miles on their car going to these shows because they would book a show, they would try to book a show almost every day of the week. So radio in the morning, then you get in your car and you take off and do your uh, live performance. Typical ticket would be 25 cents for adults, 15 cents for children, which doesn't sound like much today, but if you could uh, pack in a couple of hundred people in a school auditorium and do two shows, um, it would add up. And during the Depression years, that was uh, certainly uh, a good musical act could make more money doing that than, than, say, somebody working in a factory or a cotton mill. Another thing they did to supplement their income was to uh, sell songbooks at these uh, shows. Almost all of the hillbilly bands would print up little songbooks from time to time, and they used those to uh, promote themselves and to publicize their music, and uh, they would sell them for about a quarter. The Monroe Brothers printed up uh, at least one songbook while they were here in Raleigh. On the cover, there was a picture of the two of them, and it just said, Monroe Brothers, their life, their songs. So you had the radio, you had the personal appearances, you had the songbooks, all of these things were uh, important part, an important part of their professional life. The other important area of activity uh, was making phonograph records. Um, when the Monroes arrived here in Raleigh, they had already um, recorded three sessions for the Bluebird label. And um, they had been approached by Victor Records, that was the parent company of Bluebird. Uh, Victor Records had an A&R man, which stands for Artist and Repertoire. Um, today we'd call him probably a combination talent scout record producer. And his name was Eli Oberstein. And Oberstein had heard the Monroe Brothers on the radio, and he sent them a telegram. And he said, you guys are great. We want you to come up here to Charlotte and make records. We want to sign you to Victor Records, have you make Bluebird Records. Uh, please let us know. So Bill and Charlie get the telegram, and they look at it, eh, you know, and they just crumple it up, throw it in the trash can. They're not really that interested. And the reason is, um, the phonograph industry, the recording industry, had really taken a nosedive when the Depression hit. And that was a time when radio started ascending because if you didn't have money to pay 75 cents for a new record, well, you could just turn on the radio and there was music for free. And they were thinking, well, it's radio, it's, it's personal appearances, that's where we're making our bread and butter. We don't need to make records. But Eli Oberstein persisted and he kept sending the telegrams and finally he won them over and got him to come up to Charlotte where RCA Victor had set up their uh, recording studios and were making uh, a lot of hillbilly recordings. Charlotte became really the epicenter for hillbilly recording in the 1930s. It sort of took over from Atlanta which was the recording center for country music in the 20s. And so Eli Herbertstein uh, recorded Charlie and Bill. They worked up 10 songs, which was five records. The records were released, and the very first release, which was two gospel songs, it was a hit. It was a big hit because people had started buying records again, and people loved this particular record. And so the Monroe brothers, you know, they had a hit on their hands. Their name was, was becoming known throughout the South because of this record. So about... After that, about every six months, they would go to Charlotte and work up 10 additional songs, record 10 more songs at each session. By the time they got here to Raleigh in 1937, they had already cut three sessions in Charlotte for Bluebird, 30 songs. While they were here in Raleigh, they continued going to Charlotte and made three more sessions or 30 additional songs. So that was a total of 60 songs they recorded as the Monroe Brothers. All of them were released. And it's interesting to note that every single one of those recordings was done with one take. And there are not many bands today that could go in and do 60 songs without a second take. So radio, personal appearances, songbooks, phonograph records, 
This is what comprised their uh, professional career. The other really important thing that was going on while Charlie and Bill Monroe were here in Raleigh was their own personal relationship between the two brothers. There'd always been a lot of friction between Charlie and Bill. There was just some good old fashioned sibling rivalry. There were disagreements and arguments about management and uh, money and musical matters. All these different things just made for a, an uneasy relationship between Charlie and Bill. Before they came to Raleigh, when they had been down in Greenville, South Carolina on WFBC radio, they had worked with an announcer. He was um, actually not employed by the radio station. He was part of the Monroe Brothers team, and he had traveled with them since they had been out in the Midwest. And this was a fellow named Byron Parker. He was, like I said, he was part of the Monroe Brothers team. There was really three of them were part of the act in those days. And Byron was um, a very uh, folksy, charismatic announcer. He was very popular in his own right. And he also, he took care of a lot of the business matters uh, that concerned the Monroe brothers and did, uh, helped with their booking and did a lot of things that a manager would do. But he never called himself a manager. And I think he was smart enough to realize that um, Bill Monroe had this attitude that um, I don't want to be managed by anybody. Another important thing is that he served as a um, conciliatory buffer between Charlie and Bill. He sort of smoothed things over, made everything run uh, smoothly, and uh, prevented Charlie and Bill from just getting at each other's throats. When the radio gig in Greenville ended, Byron Parker had some other opportunities he went off on his own and left the Monroe Brothers. So when Charlie and Bill came here to Raleigh to be on WPTF, there was no more buffer, and they were bickering and arguing and by some accounts even coming to physical blows <laughs> all during the time they were here in Raleigh. It was just getting worse and worse. And there were people who would observe them down at the studios at PTF um, when they were like in the rehearsal room before they would go on the air and they would just be fighting and yelling at each other and then of course as soon as the broadcast started and the mic came on they would be totally professional. But when the WPTF uh, uh, Sieberling Tire contract came to an end in June of 1938, um, Charlie Monroe had already lined up another radio gig for them in Knoxville, Tennessee at WNOX. So Charlie said to Bill, uh, look, I've got this job for us in Knoxville. I've got my trailer all packed up and ready to go. I'm leaving Raleigh tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. If you're there tomorrow morning at 8 with your trailer, we'll head out to Knoxville and I'll know that we're still a team. If you don't show up in the morning, it's all over. So of course, Bill never showed up the next morning and that was the end of the Monroe Brothers as a musical act. And Charlie went on to Knoxville. Eventually, he formed a band called the Kentucky Partners, had a successful career in country music for a number of years. When Bill left Raleigh, he went to Little Rock, Arkansas, started a band there called the Kentuckians, uh, of course, named for the Monroe's home state, but that band didn't last long. It was just uh, about three months later they disbanded. Bill left Little Rock, traveled around a little bit, and then ended up in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was in Atlanta that Bill formed his first group that he called the Bluegrass Boys. And as they say, the rest is history because the Bluegrass Boys over the next uh, five or six years would evolve, the personnel would change, and the music would lead to what we now call bluegrass music. Most music historians point to December of 1945 as the origin of the definitive moment when bluegrass actually began. Uh, that is the moment when Earl Scruggs joined the Bluegrass Boys. Uh, Lester Flatt had joined earlier in 1945. In December, uh, Earl Scruggs came on board with his revolutionary banjo style 
And that was the final kind of missing ingredient needed to make the Bluegrass Boys and, and uh, Bill Monroe to create the true definitive bluegrass sound. However, one could argue or one could look back further and say that June of 1938 here in Raleigh, that maybe that was where the real original seed of bluegrass began. That maybe that was the real big bang where it all started. Because when Bill split from Charlie, that's what allowed Bill to, to follow his own path, to pursue his own vision, his own sound, develop his own style, and all of that is what eventually led up to December of 1945 and the creation of bluegrass. So, you know, a lot can be said about uh, the role of, of Raleigh in the history of bluegrass music, and this house here at 1208 Fillmore Street, uh, which still looks much the same as it did in those days, is um, a reminder of the role that uh, Bill and Charlie Monroe played while they were here in town. <laughs>